Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong and welcome to part four of our series on epigenetics with Professor Moshe Ziff. In the first three parts we talked about epigenetics and DNA methylation and how they are related to aging. If you missed these, please do go back and watch them for Professor Ziff's clear insight into these subjects. HKG Epitherapeutics offer an age test using DNA methylation based on a saliva sample. This fits in with Professor Ziff's goal of making the test available to a wider consumer audience. Saliva makes it more cost effective and easy to do at home without sacrificing accuracy. In this part we discuss the choice of saliva as a sample as well as how often it would be effective for you to take a biological age test. So with that let me start the interview. Because you mentioned earlier, you know, Dr. Steve Horvath's clock is, which is, has like 350 markers or something like right. that. Um, and so how did you find your markers and how did you calibrate them and how are they related to, I guess, right. any other kind of DNA methylation test? Right. So we really use the same approach that Horvath did. Uh, but what I ask myself is, it's, I, I, I want to have something simple because I thought about making it a consumer product, not mm. just a research product. And so when you think about a consumer product, it has to be high throughput. It has to be robust. It has to be relatively cost effective. So, you know, if, if you need a, a team of PhDs to analyze the data, mm. and then it's not very useful. And also I was intrigued by the question is, do we really need 350 or 7,000 or 90,000? Of course, if the more you have, you'll be, you know, you can model your system a little better, but how much better is, is it worth this whole effort? And also the second question is, the more you do, the more mistakes you can make. And since, uh, you know, biological science is not yet as perfect as physical science or even chemistry, mm -hmm. uh, there are, no, there is noise and errors in the system. And that's why we never have 100% accuracy of detection. That's why people are now surprised that not all COVID-19 is 100% because nothing in biology is 100%. Right. Uh, it is frustrating to biologists, but this is part of the system. So when you know that, you know that the more I will add to my test, the more complicated I'll make it, the more chance for error I have. So... I looked into the genome of 3,700 people that, you know, are of different ages and where we had methylation profiles mm -hmm. of 440,000 sites across the genome uh, in these people. And I asked mathematically, what is the best correlation with age across the genome? And we found that the region that was like, it, blew up everything else, right? It was so much better than anything else. And I said, if this is so, could it just, perf do we need everything else or could this perform as well? So we tested that. So essentially we compared the performance of the 350 sites mm -hmm. and the performance of this one region. And they were almost, they were equal. And so we uh, decided that we're going to develop this as a product. The second question is the Horvath clock was initially developed for blood. And even there was a sophistication there of, um, you know, accounting for changes in blood cell types with a complicated algorithm. And I said, okay, this is not going to work when we, I want to do it on a billion people. Because, you know, this test will be effective if millions of people will take it, then we can learn really what's going on. Right. And there were, um, uh, we, uh, we tested whether saliva will do it. And remarkably, the correlation with age in saliva was better than even in blood. And, it, and, uh, and that made a simple system where everybody can spit, we send them a kit, it gets back to our labs. They can spit it anywhere in the world. Uh, we can assay it anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, using uh, the Amazon model, which mm. is, you know, have a retail store you know next to you or a clinic next to you uh, these kind of products consumer products in medicine will become more popular because you know they will allow to deliver tests to more people 
in a in more e with more ease. So right. this is was the idea. Then we used a uh, you know we wanted to use the most robust method to uh, analyze this with next generation sequencing, which allowed us to multiplex the whole thing so we can do hundreds of people at the same time, reduce the costs, and then make it more feasible for the customer. And so we want to test that, you know, a customer can take, you know, once or twice a year. And the most important is not your age, but how are you moving? You know, mm -hmm. what is the trajectory? Are you getting older fast in your own clock? You know, how is your own personal clock moving? So when we tell you this is your epigenetic age, it's kind of an average or a best mathematical fit to, to the distribution in the general population. But this is... This just tells you how good you are relative to the average person in the street, but that's not enough for you, right? You want to know how what you're doing in life is affecting this. And uh, the second thing is what I call the soft learning is you want to keep learning and analyze what you're doing. So we coupled it with an app that you know can uh, collect. Uh, questions that uh, in a simple way that we think are critical uh, for aging. And we also offer a suggestion of compounds that nutritional supplements that science has some evidence, uh, you know, mostly based on animal data and that um, they can uh, slow down processes that are involved with aging. For example, SAMI was shown to improve cognitive decline, which is one of the things that happen when you age. It has a positive effect on, on preventing cancer and, uh, and other pain, pain and, and you know, arthritis and other things. And we have uh, certain vitamins that are known to affect age. Um, so we will like to offer a larger and larger suggestion of based on, so every, every product we'll put there, there will be literature there. So the interested person can read the original literature and decide for his own. We're not giving advice. We are organizing the advice that comes from science uh, so that a person can, can take decisions. The, the main important thing is that it's all based on trial and error and what works for one might not work for the other. So you have to, to teach yourself what is the best that is working for you. And I think we'll, this, this will be much more dominant motive in medicine and, and, and health is that it doesn't, there's no one size fits all. And so the methylation clock provides you a, a, some sort of a physical measure uh, of how you're doing. Hmm. And, by sharing this data, uh, confident, you know, in an anonymous way, we will learn more and more. For example, does esadenazilmethine or SAMI really slow down cognitive decline in humans? So we have, you know, we have very few people, we have animal experiments, but it will never be sorted out till it's done in what I call in the wild, till people in the real context of life are taking it and reporting back and testing themselves. So we want to build a community of people who are taking responsibility over, you know, their well-being and, uh, and happy to share it in a, in a, in a learning process. And they, they feel as partners to the learning, not just to, uh, to receiving the uh, advice. Right. So you actually touched on a couple of points that I wanted to talk about, but um, so, but let's split it up a little bit. Um, so, so one question that I did have, so I certainly get that, you know, you want to measure, you want to see how things are progressing, right? It's not a point in time thing. It's like, so would you have any advice, although you don't give advice, but would you have any advice on how often it would make sense to take a test? Like every week, it'd obviously not make any sense, but every three, 10 years would also not make any sense. So right. would, would you, yeah. Have any advice? I mean, our advice will get better as as we get more data, right? Yeah. And and um, so as more people take the test, and some will take it frequently, and others will not, because that's naturally how people are. And and that's the beauty of collecting data without forcing people have to give the data, right? Because mm. we get the 
natural distribution. Some people will test once in a lifetime and others will test multiple times. I think our accuracy is not sufficient enough to see you know, three months or four months. But I think by yearly, by annually, uh, might be reasonable. First to validate also the results, right? So, you know, there could be some unusual thing happening, but then this, the clock stabilizes. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, a yearly measure of how, so I will say twice a year just to, to get a more accurate call. And, um, and yearly, because this will allow you to really, you know, see your trajectory yeah, if you have enough points. Um, and, uh, you know, from anecdotal evidence, we did find people that changed positively, people who did dramatic changes in their life because they found themselves on the older uh, age. Right. And, uh, and so that's, that's good in any case, you know, if, if, mm. it, in, if it incentivizes you. Uh, although there are some people who claim, you know, I do everything right and I still am older. Um, so my answer is, you know, you might be right and we might be wrong. I mean, it's possible. As I said, right. medicine is never 100%, um, even in the best case scenario. But there's another possibility that you might think that you're doing all the things right, but you might not be. So, for example, one of the things a lot of people who are engaged in physical activity don't take into account is mental and mental health and physical activity stresses you out probably stress of doing it outweighs the positive so so we have to start weighing your, your entire context and we have some stress questions as well and you know some things that tie into other aspects of well-being and, and this is what I, I was suggesting before first there's a heterogeneity in life experiences right so mm. You know, uh, for somebody who has a relaxed day, doing one hour gym in the morning is not an excessive, you know, requirement and it won't stress him, it will relax him. On the other hand, if you have deadlines coming up and uh, you are extremely stressed and you work till two o'clock in the morning, not because you want to, because you have to, and sometimes life is like that. In that context, maybe taking one hour in the gym that cuts down your sleep, you know, from six hours, which is manageable, to four hours, which is uh, pathologic, uh, could be causing that. So I think that when you get a result that, that is weird, because you say, I'm eating good food, you know, I'm not eating meat, I'm exercising, I'm taking all the supplements, why am I older than what I should be? And, uh, and, and I think that you should weigh these things. You know, it's not that all we can figure out, but these are things that we need to think about. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. In the fifth and final part, we will discuss some anti-aging supplements and how the next level of trials could be conducted through social media. So please do subscribe and hit the bell button to get notification when it's released. I wish you all well and I will speak to you again soon.